Hi there, and welcome to a special edition of Power and Politics. I'm David Cochran in Ottawa. We're about halfway through Parliament's summer break, and we've assembled our panel of party insiders to check the pulse of Canadian politics this summer and see where the three main parties stand. We're going to start with the governing Liberals. Now, the temperature inside their caucus, it's cooled somewhat. Since the shock of the Toronto-St. Paul's by-election, it seems fairly certain at this point the full caucus won't meet until September, despite loud demands to meet right away. And a cabinet shuffle, beyond replacing Seamus O'Regan with Stephen McKinnon, seems less certain to happen. That, despite that stunning by-election loss in that safe Toronto seat. Last week's uh, by-election loss, uh, not to sugarcoat it, was, was challenging. You hear about that by-election in Toronto? I've had uh, lots of calls with uh, different members of caucus uh, from across the country, not just in the GTA. Ever since, Justin Trudeau has been in panic mode. The reflection after, after a tough loss, but there's also so much to do, and I am committed to doing the work. Don't feel offended, Calgary, that Justin Trudeau is hiding from you. He's actually hiding from his own caucus. <laughs> Conversations that we're all having as Liberals uh, are going to continue. Well, our party insiders aren't hiding. They've cut their summer short to check the pulse of Canadian politics. Greg McEachern is a former Liberal ministerial staffer. Melanie Richet, former communications director for the NDP. And Fred Delory, former Conservative campaign manager. Now, during the show, we're going to assess the state of each of your parties and pick some issues to uh, watch in the fall. And the Liberals are up first. So, Greg, you're the first item up for bids. Uh, where, where, where is the governing party at this stage in the cycle? First of all, I look around this room. I was once held in a room very much like this <laughs> for four hours. <laughs> Without uh, an outcome. Yeah. In Toronto, St. Paul's. And so I, 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 think, know, I know the outcome. Is. I know the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't remind me. So I think uh, I'll start there because I think the summer was, uh, the, the topics were set in Canadian politics by the Liberal defeat in, in St. Paul's. And there's been a lot of conversations and I think the clip that you just played you know, highlights that. So all of a sudden, you know, things are good until they're not. And that was a riding that the Liberals should have won. And for a lot of reasons, you could, you know, uh, you could um, see it telegraphed. It was funny, the day that we did, um, we taped the show, um, I had a pit in my stomach. I was nervous that you were going to ask me for a prediction. Because right. if you put me on the spot, my prediction, I can sound like a Monday morning quarterback here, but my prediction was that the Liberals were probably going to lose hmm. based on um, reporters that I talked to and a couple of Liberals whose opinion uh, I, I think highly of. So that has kind of said everything. And it was uh, kind of the proof positive that things are not great for, for, for Liberals, for Liberal fortunes. I mean, we had a year of polling. Um, since that time, though, um, caucus has somewhat ca quieted down. But I don't know if the Prime Minister can count on that forever. There'll be a lead right. up. People love, like media love a process story. So there'll be a, a summer caucus uh, in BC um, before the House goes back. There'll be a lead up about how people are feeling. And, and if somebody is angry, you'll, you'll probably hear that. But we've not heard a lot of that. And that's to the Prime Minister's benefit. Is he using that time wisely? Um, you know, what are they considering to do? Um, I'm wondering at this point, if what Justin Trudeau needs to do is to Doug Ford this, and he needs to say, mea culpa. Right. Um, and, and I get it. There's a logical exercise here. He is not the cause of global inflation, but people are angry, and they're angry because of inflation. So how do you communicate that? We talk about Bill Clinton back in the 90s, feel your pain. There needs to be some sort. I, I, a cabinet shuffle is not going to do it. Ads aren't going to do it as much as I'd like to see ads. But he needs to somehow uh, grab this problem, seize it, and tell Canadians, I get it. Do they shuffle the cabinet? It seems less and less likely to me as they go on. We watched Seamus O'Regan leave. Had he known there was a bigger change coming, he might have waited for that to happen. What, what's your sense? If they shuffle the cabinet, it is not going to be with the design that this is going to fix things. Of course. They're going to shuffle the cabinet because they want to do that. It may be related to people running again and not running again, but they know that it's not going to be a, a quick fix. Um, a month ago, I would have said 80% against a cabinet shuffle. Now I'm 50-50. But they don't think it's going to be the, 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 the solve your problems cabinet shuffle. Right. So, so Fred, uh, as you pointed out, we do know the ending of what happened that last time Greg was uh, here in the studio for a long period of time. What do you think about where the Liberals are right now? They pushed off the caucus meeting. It seems like they're going to ride out what discontent was there. Don't know about the big sh shuffle or big direction changes. Where do you think they are? Uh, well, uh, as you recall, we had a, a show right after the by-election, and mm -hmm. we talked mm -hmm. about this, what they should do this summer. 
and I laid out they shouldn't call a caucus meeting. Trudeau and his team should go to ground, map out what their actual strategy is. Mm -hmm. They seem to have at least followed the part where they're not calling a caucus meeting, which I think would have been bad for Trudeau. I think that would have been a lot of uh, anger, a lot of mics, hot mics coming out of there, a lot of hot takes. Um, they've kind of gone to ground. They've gone to ground, yep. but are they going to come out of this with a narrative and a plan, a strategy? Mm -hmm. And you're right, it's a, a cabinet shuffle. I don't know what that's going to do. It's not just the people in the places, it's what they're talking about every day and what their messaging is. And that's what's been lacking this whole time. They haven't been telling that story. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I've been most impressed with, though, is the the apparent loyalty Trudeau does have with this caucus. Yeah. It's been amazing. You know, we've seen the, the exact same week that he had this devastating loss, Biden had that uh, disastrous debate performance. And we've seen, th you know, three weeks <laughs> later, Biden's out. Yeah. And a lot of high profile uh, Democratic senators and Congress people were out pushing him out. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that with Trudeau. I know we had a few MPs, uh, but those are the same MPs, like my favorite liberal MP, Ken McDonald. Uh, <laughs> even, he's, even he didn't say it. Even he right. said he's but earned he's the say, right to go when he wants right. to go, right? right. But, they're the one, but they're the loudest, and they're not mm -hmm. saying... Yeah, you're right, they're not even saying that. Mm -hmm. So I've been impressed with the, the, the... It feels like blind loyalty that Trudeau has with his caucus. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you look at his track record, he's won three elections in a row. He's took a party from 35 seats in third place, or fourth place, whatever it was, third place, to government. Yeah. Uh, so maybe he's earned that, but it's, uh, it's just, it is a fascinating contrast with the U.S. Yeah, Wayne, Wayne Long uh, publicly said he had to go, but Wayne Long, uh, Mel, we've learned, is no Nancy Pelosi, because Justin <laughs> Trudeau is, is still there. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on, on the state of the Liberals this summer? Right, well, credit to where credit's due. When you said, you know, don't do a caucus meeting, I was like, I, all I could think of was 2019, when, you know, RMPs were coming after the leader in the lead-up to the 2019 election, and I thought, you need to talk to those folks, but I, I think we've seen, you know, folks have gone underground, they've been able to um, temper those feelings coming out of the by-election, so, so that's, that's, I guess, a good news story for the Prime Minister. Um, but to, to your point about, you know, I think they've learned the lesson that a cabinet shuffle isn't going to fix their problems. Last summer, if, if folks remember, they came out with this cabinet shuffle and they were saying, you know, this is going to solve all our problems, it's going to solve the mm. disconnects that we have with people, and it it really didn't do anything. You know, we've seen Minister Fraser have some good messaging on housing, but other than that, it has actually left them par probably further apart from, from the Conservatives than it did kind of last year. Well, it led to two big things. It led to a vacancy in Toronto St. Paul's, and, and Greg, it's led to a vacancy in La Salle Mar Verdun, where right. there's another test coming up later this summer. So, Mel, like, you know, they, they, they created problems with totally. a shuffle there that I think they are keen to avoid. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a, a good point. A repeat of, right? That's a good point. But, but, in the kind of flip argument that I have there, you know, we were all taken by rumors the last week or two that the Prime Minister's people were saying that Minister Freeland had to go and kind of putting all of the communications issues on Minister Freeland. And, you know, we mm. as a panel have talked about uh, Minister Freeland maybe um, inability to connect with people, but to take all of the responsibility from the Prime Minister and put it on Minister Freeland, I don't think is um, in any way, shape or form fair. And, and if the Prime Minister is not coming up with a message to your point, then, then what are we doing? So it's right. interesting to me that those rumors have kind of gone away a little bit, mm. but um, I guess to see in the next month where that goes. Yeah, so, so Greg, you know, what do they do? They, they've kind of gone underground, as Fred says, they've avoided the caucus meeting, at least until uh, September. It's gonna be a cabinet retreat towards the end of August, so the, the usual summer events and planning cycles. What, what do you think your crowd needs to put on the table at these events to show they've heard, they've listened, they're responding, and as Fred always says, they're trying to craft a narrative that Canadians will hear and, and want to hear. First thing is to stop the stupid leaked stories that are heavily sourced, and on the one that Mel refers to, I've heard from a lot of people that they questioned whether or not, I mean, it, it was very convenient because it sounded very similar to mm -hmm. what happened to Bill Morneau a couple of summers ago. Somebody gets out over their skis and all of a sudden, in that case, what I was told was that should have been a bigger cabinet shuffle, but instead they put the former finance minister in an awkward position. And on this one, I, you know, I've been very critical of Minister Freeland's communications uh, skills on this panel. But if you don't want somebody around in the private sector, in the, you know, in government, have the guts to have that conversation with them face to face. Yeah. And there was a huge pushback from liberals about their discomfort with somebody who had served this government for the amount of time mm -hmm. that Minister Freeland did. And look, if you want to make change, you're the Prime Minister, absolutely do that. But 
there's been a lot of people that have kind of questioned those those leak stories, and I think um, it sent the message for people to perhaps kind of lock down your communications and, and maybe not be um, as uh, free with your thought process about what you think should happen versus what's actually going on. Right. So, so if they're not going to move Freeland, uh, which right now doesn't seem like they're going to do, uh, unless they the 50-50 comes up heads or tails, to, to, like what what is the what is the other kind of reset? Is there an easy narrative reset for them? Is there a policy shift, Greg, that you think is on the table that they can they can show that there is the change available that voters seem to want? I'm going to pivot away from that because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they did stick with the narrative of housing and affordability. Right. Um, and it didn't move the needle. They did a really good job mm -hmm. of rolling out the budget and pre-budget announcements, and it didn't move the needle. So where are, you, where are you left? And it is your opponent. And I noticed this week that the Liberals have started to do some um, videos that they're posting. They're not, there's not paid behind it. I would hope, I would request, I would heavily suggest that you put some paid emphasis behind reminding people who the Conservative leader is. Right. Uh, there was an Abkis poll that said not a lot of people recognize the Conservative leader, and of those that did, half of them had a negative response. I would be working on that like hell. Okay, uh, Fred, last uh, 40 seconds or so to you. Uh, well, on the Liberals and what they should be doing, I think it's they have to go back to that opposition mindset when they innovated mm. back in 2015 mm. and came up with those new things that they're doing. Uh, that's what they should be doing now, focusing on that. Stop letting government bog you down. Mm. Uh, you are the government, there's no question, but when you're stuck in that mindset that you know you have this feeling that there's only so much you can do, opposition parties can do everything, right? They have the mindset, we can change mm -hmm, everything. Mm -hmm. and that Liberals need to get back to that if they want to be successful. Okay, uh, we're going to take a break, but up next we're going to talk about the Conservatives. Where do things stand with the official opposition? Stay right there. Welcome back to this special edition of Power and Politics. We're looking at where the political parties stand at the halfway point of summer. We just took a look at liberal fortunes. Now, what can we expect from the Conservatives this fall? They're riding high in the polls and in Parliament after that breakthrough by-election win in Toronto. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has been a frequent visitor to Montreal, where another by-election looms in La Salamard Verdun. So, where do things stand with the Conservatives? The leader opposite is showing us exactly what shameful, spineless leadership looks like. When will we put an end to this wacko policy by this wacko prime minister? It was a choice to pander to white nationalists, not an accident. And it is a choice to continue to not condemn them. Will the prime minister stop giving out insane quantities of heroin-grade opioids? We will continue to be there to help heal people, not imprison them. Will he reverse this job-killing tax on Canadians? Conservatives stand with the wealthiest. We stand with the middle class. It's been a lot quieter this summer. Back with me are political insiders, Melanie Richet, Craig McHecker, and uh, Fred Delory. So, Fred, um, they're not doing that this summer. Uh, it seems to me what you're seeing with the Conservatives is pound the doors, raise the cash, run the ads, beat the libs. That's their new four-line mantra this yeah. summer. We're, we're, what's your sense of where the Conservatives are at this point in the year? Well, they're in a great spot. A <laughs> uh, 20 point lead is something I've never seen in my lifetime. Um, and they just need to keep focusing on that. You know, you, you, when you kicked off the show, we showed a number of clips of Polyev around the country. Mm -hmm. He is uh, speaking quite loudly on, uh, on Trudeau and his record. Um, but what he has in front of him right now is the biggest challenge every conservative leader always faces is don't screw up. Mm. Uh, don't do anything that's going to hurt the cause. Um, it, it's something, and it's not just him, it's candidates, it's other members of the caucus that tend to uh, shoot ourselves in the foot. Right. Uh, and that's got to be the number one preoccupied issue right now when you have the lead they have and going into whenever this campaign is. So, no, they're going to keep, they're going to hold the line, if you will, and continue mm -hmm. to do uh, what they've been doing. He, he's been in Montreal a lot. That's not really about La Salle Mar. That's more about Mount Royal yeah. and some of those ridings, like Anthony House Father. See, wouldn't you say? It, 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 absolutely, and it's amazing to think that we're competitive in Montreal. Like <laughs> in a, this entire country, when Polyev became leader, the areas that they were looking to focus on and grow was British Columbia, Northern Ontario, and the mm -hmm. 905 around Toronto. Well, now they have a 416 with St. Paul's, and now he's going into parts of Quebec uh, that unthinkable uh, just a few years ago. So, Mel, a lot of the places they're looking to grow are at the New Democrats' expense. Uh, I mean, they obviously took Toronto-St. Paul from the, from, from the Liberals, but there's the blue-orange switchers. What's your sense of Pierre Polyev and his rigid me message discipline, his focus on things, but like really sharp rhetoric uh, that, you know, Liberals and New Democrats would say is very much over the top. Where do you think they are right now? Right. 
So what's interesting on his kind of summer tour plans, and this is something that um, the, the tour team of the NDP was talking to me about, is Jigmeet's going obviously to a lot of the same ridings that, that mm -hmm. Pierre is going to, and they're speaking to the same kind of electorate. And what folks, excuse me, in those ridings are saying is they've noticed that Pierre Poliev comes in for his rally, and then he kind of just heads out, whereas Jigmeet is there for three days, for four days, for five days, talking not just to people who are showing up to those rallies, but folks at the grocery store, other folks in the community. And what they've started to notice is that um, while they like mm. the message that he's been saying on that day when he's coming in, they're asking where is he the next day or where is he a few days. So they've really appreciated that Jigmeet has been there, um, you know, a few days in a row. So, so I think uh, when it comes to those those orange blue voters, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. We've been looking at polling, and some of those who would have voted for the NDP, some of those folks who would have voted for the NDP in the last election, may have been persuaded by the, cons by the conservatives. I don't think that they're lost to the conservatives, and I think one of the things that the mm. NDP is focused on doing this summer is talking to the same folks that that Poliev is trying to talk to, that he's. Um, piqued their curiosity, maybe I'll say. Right. They've piqued their interest, but what Jigmeet and his team are focused on is bringing those folks back, back over to the NDP. So, so Greg, Fred's uh, three-word mantra is don't <laughs> screw up, right? And, and that's what liberals are counting on. Where, where, where have they got to be careful, the conservatives right now? Um, legalizing crack. Any show of hands, who here thinks that Justin Trudeau <laughs> legalized crack this year? Yeah. No, no hands. But, you know, recent tweet from the conservative leader says that. So I'm not, I don't totally agree with you that they've gone quiet on these, you know, rabid things. I think that um, for a number of reasons, um, the premiers were talking about, um, were, were forced to talk about following the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, the tone. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations in the U.S. about it. There's, uh, you know, I think there needs to be uh, a bigger conversation in Canada uh, about that tone. The, the challenge for, um, I think, the, the political climate right now is that the appetite for change, you have a change agent in the Conservative leader who is saying things that a lot of Canadians are very, very uncomfortable with. But they're very angry, very right. angry at the Liberals, so what are they going to do? So Liberals really need to work on, on that messaging. And as I said earlier, I think, you know, paid advertising might be a way to go about that. But there also needs to be, you know, the scrutiny did increase uh, on the Conservative leader. It has a ways to go because I don't see anybody when, you know, he talked about legalizing crack. I didn't see any op-eds, you know, decrying that, that type of language. So I think, um, you know, a Conservative friend of mine said to me that he thinks that the Conservative leader has not had his worst day yet. Right. that there is something going to come up. And you have to be really careful with overconfidence. We saw that uh, earlier in the spring when he did the, um, he was uh, traveling around the New Brunswick, Nova Scotia border, and that stopped to the people that, you know, there was a lot of questionable activity going on there. And you could actually see during the video where he kind of looked that, you know, like he realized that he might not, this might not have been a good idea. If he does something like that again, the Liberals have to be really prepared to seize on it, and they have to call out media when they're not covering it. So, uh, Fred, on that, like the, the legalizing crack thing, that, that's a criticism of the Liberals' uh, decriminalization policies or willingness to do it. They're not legalizing crack. If I tried to sell you crack cocaine in any of these decrim jurisdictions, we would both be arrested. If you were caught with a couple of rocks, you'd be maybe gotten into treatment. You know, it's, it's that sort of a thing. So it's an exaggeration. Is that an area where they are vulnerable to the don't screw up? Uh, is Greg on something there, or do you think it's something else? I think the way information travels now that it's not as risky as it used to be. And right. to Greg's point, where media isn't covering this stuff. All we're hearing is Polyev, what he's saying and what leaders are saying. It doesn't quite get covered or it doesn't get rebutted in any ways. So I, I think it's more dangerous if there's any kind of policy pronouncement that is offside or uh, a big play that they make that would put them at risk. I don't think that is something necessarily, obviously if they say something incredibly crazy, then that would be a problem. But isn't accusing the government of legalizing crack kind of incredibly crazy? I mean, I mean I take your point. The media isn't covering a lot of these things, and I don't have an answer as to why. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I, I would love to have a conservative MP sitting right there, but they're not coming on. But you know, I tried to be an MP, but <laughs> so, sorry, exactly. Um, no, look, it's, it's funny we're talking about this. I actually haven't heard that quote until today, mm -hmm. until we're on the show. So it has not. It's been a social media so. thing. They're firing all over the place, right? Right, and yeah. they're and they're targeting and how they're doing it is just crushing everybody. And that goes back to my point earlier about the liberals. In 2015, they were the innovative party when they were in opposition. Mm -hmm. They innovated, they changed the game, particularly in social media, where the Conservatives didn't even have a social media campaign in 2015. And they have 
now flipped the script where the yeah. liberals are doing whatever they were doing 10 years ago. They're still doing that. The conservatives are now firing on all cylinders. And, and Mel, they're firing on all cylinders and staying on pure offense, yeah. right? They're, they just shrug off any attempt to put on defense and move on to the next attack. And that seems to be the challenge the liberals in particular are having is yeah. trying to put them on the defensive for totally. a change. Totally. And, and not to, you know, take up space to talk about the liberals when we're talking about the conservatives, but, you know, you talked about the website or the framing up of Pierre Polyev that the liberals have been trying to do. It's 2024. He's been leader for three years in September, yeah. I think. Like, that yeah. is absolutely wild to me that it has taken this long to try to frame him as he is as leader. In the absence of framing who Pierre Polyev is as leader, he's been totally able to reframe himself. And meanwhile, he's one of the politicians who's been here the longest. He should be the one of the people the least able to reframe himself. And, and all of this space has really given him free range to, to recraft himself as who he is as a person when he's talking to people. Um, on, on the discipline, I think that there's a few, um, not I think, there are a few provincial uh, elections coming up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the provincial parties that are uh, doing well are, are doing well because they've gotten a bit of a bump to, to Pierre Poirier. I think Folks will be paying close attention to those candidates. I'm thinking British Columbia in particular. A lot of the candidates that um, uh, John Rustad has brought on board have said some really problematic things. He's having to fire people. He's having to talk about this on an everyday basis. And I think those um, problems with discipline, because they're not necessarily his folks, but they're folks that are directly linked to him, will start causing him bigger problems um, as people go to the polls and are paying right. a little bit of a closer attention. I would, I would not be surprised to see some of the, um, what do you call them, bozo eruptions or whatnot, <laughs> yeah. to, to land yeah. on Pierre Poitier's desk and, and have to answer for them. So, so Greg, we've got about 90 seconds left, but like if you look at the U.S. election cycle, you know, until Joe Biden said he was not going to run, mm -hmm. the focus was on the odds of the next election and less about the stakes of the next election. Mm -hmm. And, and that's been very much, going back to your point about journalists loving a process story, that's been very much the conversation in Canada. The polls and the tactics that are used to maintain the lead in the polls, mm -hmm. you, the liberals, really need to get it back to the stakes of what a change might be. A absolutely. And I, I kind of hope to hire Mel based on what you just said. <laughs> that, that kind of, you know, there's a good prescription there. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, for reporters, it's really easy to tell a data story on polling numbers because yep. it's data. And and we all know the number of you know reporters that are no longer on social media because of what, what you know. <laughs> right here. Point, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, because of that. And so it does tend to be easier to tell a polling story than, um, well, you know, he the conservative leader doesn't want to be compared to Donald Trump. Then stop sounding like Donald Trump. Stop yelling and blaming the media for everything when you don't talk to them half the time. There's so many things that they say in similarity. I, I mean, Donald Trump is compared to populist leaders all over the world, mm. not just in Canada. So if you sound like him and you don't want to be, you know, cast in with him, then don't sound like him. Last 30 seconds to you, Fred. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I would just argue that I think there's a quite a contrast between Polyev and, uh, and Donald Trump. Do you think the media is too easy on Polyev, though? Uh, I'm curious. You, do I think they're too easy on him? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I think he's. Uh, I, I, look, I think media has a problem telling any story. I don't <laughs> think they're, um, you know, necessarily uh, easy or hard on Polyev. Okay. All right. We're going to leave it there because we looked into our crystal balls for the Liberals and the Conservatives. But what could the NDP have in store in the months ahead? Stick around and find out. That conversation coming up next. Welcome back to this special edition of Power and Politics, in which we're looking at where the parties stand at the halfway point of summer. We've gone over the Liberals and the Conservatives, but how have the summer months treated? the NDP. We've seen the rollout of the new federal dental plan, something the NDP pushed the Liberals to introduce as part of their agreement to keep them in power. What other priorities will they be pushing in the weeks and months ahead? We fought for certain things in the budget that, we, that are very important, that are going to give relief to people. Uh, we have some serious concerns, and I want to hear from the Prime Minister what his plan is to address those concerns. I don't entirely understand the position of the NDP and pulling back both from affordability measures and uh, from uh, the fight against climate change. Pierre Polyev has no desire to read the report, to learn about what happened concerning the way he was selected as leader. The Liberal government, they, they've refused to put in place strengthening, strengthened penalties. If corporations are doing the crime, then they have to pay the fine. Justin Trudeau and Pierre Polyev are putting the interests of their party ahead of the country. 
All right, back with me are our political insiders, Fred Delory, Greg McKecker, and Melanie Richet. Mel, there's a lot of tension in this marriage of convenience between <laughs> Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau, if you look at the clips. But before we get into those issues, the NDP have a by-election as well. It's not just La Salle Mard and, and St. Paul's in the, in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Elmwood Transcona, what are your thoughts there? Daniel Blakey's old seat. Yeah, um, you know, I am quite fond of Daniel Blakey. I miss him a lot in mm -hmm. caucus. He was always a, a very reasonable and pragmatic person in that caucus. And um, I know that folks miss him. But that being said, Daniel is obviously um, back in Winnipeg helping Premier Canu do some really cool things. And at the same time, he is also helping um, make sure that that seat stays orange um, in Winnipeg. So we've got a great candidate. The NDP has a great candidate who's been knocking on doors for a while. Obviously, that's uh, a riding where it's orange-blue voters. So this is a riding that they're mm -hmm. most likely going up against the, the Conservatives in Pierre Poilievre. But they're feeling good. They are... Um, receptive to what people are saying on the ground is, is good stuff for them. And you'll you'll obviously remember that, that Premier Knuch just had a really good election out there and a good by-election in Tuxedo where... Is Tuxedo in Elmwood Transcona? No, it's, it's kind of adjacent, but some right. of the same, um, I would say some of the... Um, the feeling that was present in Tuxedo is, is feelings that we're seeing present in, gotcha. in Elmwood Transcona. So um, obviously nobody's taking anything... Um, uh, Nobody's taking anything for granted. For granted. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, nobody's taking anything for granted. They're they're working hard to keep that that riding orange. But uh, I think folks feel confident that that that's going to happen. For sure. Fred, just your quick thoughts on uh, I, that is seen as a blue orange battle. I mean, what are your thoughts on where the Conservatives are potentially in Elmwood Transcona? Yeah, we've held that seat before, and mm -hmm. I think uh, we feel emboldened. We're going to win it again. Uh, which would be a blow to the NDP to lose a seat, of course, mm -hmm. if they end up picking up one in Quebec. Yeah. That, that maybe <laughs> it balances out. But I think that's uh, that, that's ripe for the uh, to turn blue. Okay. All right. So let's, Mel, let's just yeah. go. Uh, where, where do you think Jagmeet Singh sure. and his party are right yeah. now? He's traveling around a lot, yep. um, you know, uh, focusing on sort of the, the class issues and yep. big corporations. Where do you totally. think the New Democrats are at this point? Greg kept talking about putting money behind ads. Well, the NDP is putting money behind <laughs> ads of Jagmeet talking to people and framing up the issues and framing up how the Liberals and the Conservatives are the same, and he's putting something forward that's different. So so that's really great to see and, and great to see the NDP putting money behind that to position themselves as um, an opposition to... Um, to the Prime Minister, to Justin Trudeau, that is maybe more hopeful or has more pragmatic solutions mm. than just um, Pierre Bourdieu's talking points. Um, on that, what I find interesting about this summer is we're seeing uh, Jagmeet in a lot of writings that the NDP does not hold. We're seeing him in, in red writings a lot. We saw him in Edmonton Centre with a really great candidate uh, at Edmonton um, talking to folks about bringing that seat over. He's been spending a lot of time in Montreal with, with the uh, candidate Craig Sauvé in Montreal for that by-election. And I think we're going to see him in Halifax and we're going to see him at other places mm. where that orange-red vote is really strong. And I think that's a result of the efforts that they've had coming out of the deal. Now, are they happy with the deal? Or are they necessarily happy with their partners? Probably not. We're hearing that, you know, Jigmeet and, and caucus aren't necessarily. But they are seeing that the, I guess, goal of the deal to really solidify that orange-red voter base and, and to tell those folks um, the Liberals don't get what you're going through. We do, and we've been right. able to, to show that we are able to get some good things done for you, I think is working in those writings, um, and I think that's what Jigmeet's focused on. Greg, your, your coalition partner's coming for all your seats in the by-elections, <laughs> you know, if, if Halifax becomes open and La Salle and are done and, and they're spending money on ads. What, what are your thoughts on the New Democrats as we, we hit the summer? Uh, the other thing that I would notice is that the NDP leader was in Northern Ontario recently, and, mm -hmm. and Charlie Angus' seat holding... Um, Timmins uh, would be probably a big target of the Conservatives um, as well. So um, I, I think you're, there is um, some advertising going around uh, the dental plan. I think mm. there's more coming, and this would be, you know, Government of Canada advertising, telling people that it's there. Um, does the deal hold? Mm. Um, and, you know, does a by-election win for the NDP um, if they were to pick up, say, a seat in Quebec or, you know, they easily hold... Um, Daniel's seat, does that send them a message that um, this deal worked for you? I've said on this panel many times that I don't understand why the NDP are not able to make a bigger deal out of the wins that they've gotten. You right. know, we have the NDP leader, they'll get uh, a big accomplishment and then he'll pivot. And as I say, he sounds like a less strident version of the Conservative leader. That's the biggest thing. Uh, will the deal hold? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think even if the deal doesn't hold. I don't think we're, that means that the NDP want to rush into an election. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, right now is, are you getting feedback? Is the NDP getting feedback that um, from either their rank and file or from their constituents 
that they're happy with their performance in Parliament and what they've accomplished. Yeah, so, so Fred, the supply and conference agreement is supposed to last about another 10 months, June of 2025. Right. Uh, the hiccup to me is the budget, obviously. We'll yeah. see where that goes. But what's your sense? Do we start to see more daylight between them throughout the fall? Do you think the NDP need to sort of like move uh, away from Justin Trudeau a bit over the next coming months if they're going to be the change agent in the next election? They absolutely have to if they want to be able to be successful in the next election. Uh, they have to break the deal. Uh, and it's got to be this fall. They have to come out and say it's done. They have to pick a lane and be aggressive with it. Uh, you can't have it two ways. We're now into election season, a year away, um, and they're going to have to put, pull the gloves off uh, and actually go after the Liberals on different things. And it's, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have election scares potentially in the fall. It won't happen. Um, but they need to do that if they want to be a real uh, player in this game. Do, do you think they can do that while dental and pharma are still in the formational phase of those programs? Do you think can do it before those are done? If they are a credible, serious party that wants to form government on their own, they need to come out and say, we're just, we're going to win the election and we're going to do this. Uh, you can put it in those terms. Uh, now, will Canadians believe them? They have to believe it themselves. Mm. And if they don't, then that's another issue they have. Mel, how do you balance that, right? Because they want to get these, they say it's about results for Canadians, right? And results for Canadians are getting these programs that you made your condition of your support up and running and formed and then in a position that... If the Conservatives win and yep. cut them, people see it and right. feel it. Totally. How do you do that mm -hmm. and separate yourself from the Liberals in a right. politically meaningful way? Right. Well, I think they've been tr they've been doing that dance since they said yes to the Supply and Confidence Agreement back in 2022 now, right? They've had to speak to two different audiences. They've had to speak to folks who have a lot of time for the Prime Minister but mm -hmm. don't think that the Prime Minister is doing the right things. And they've had to speak to people who are really disappointed with the Prime Minister and don't have time for him at all. And I think that that's something that they're going to continue to have to do in the lead up to the next election. I do agree with you, though, though that they do need to distance themselves from um, from the Liberals and the Prime Minister, and I think that's likely what they're hearing on the ground. I think they are hearing that folks are happy with what they've been able to do, but I think folks are coming to the realization that the Prime Minister and his team are not willing to do more. So I think, thank you for getting us dental care, for getting us pharma care. Um, I'm not sure that this will continue uh, for much longer, and I think that that's mm. likely what they're hearing on the ground. And I think this is, you know, a potentially good opportunity for them to say, we got everything we could with, uh, with the Liberal government. If we want A, B, C, you're going to have to vote NDP in the next election. Uh, uh, Greg, is there, I don't know if there's fiscal room to do more based on where things are and the desire to keep things below what, you know, the fiscal anchor of $40 billion deficits. What's your sense of, of the longevity of, of supply and confidence agreement going forward. I, I, the next budget, uh, to me, is the inflection point. Do you think it could be earlier? Uh, I, I think the, um, the agreement is, it's up to the NDP. I think the Liberals are happy to continue it and wait, you know, until, you know, 2025 and, you know, push it until they, you know, I, I, I don't, I guess as long as they can. But it's really up to the NDP. And, and I would expect that this fall, you're going to see the results of what they've been hearing all summer, which is probably the same thing that people heard on the doorstep in St. Paul's. And I think if you're a, a realistic and pragmatic liberal, you have to be prepared for that. They're hearing the same thing that everyone else is. Okay, uh, up next, our political sides. We're going to break down what to expect in the fall. What could be Justin Trudeau's last fall as prime minister? Who knows? Stay right there. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to this special edition of Power and Politics. Today we've been going over what to expect from the federal parties this fall. The Liberals need to keep it together, the Conservatives need to keep the momentum, while the NDP needs to get some credit for all of those new programs. But now our insiders are going to tell us what they're watching for on the political calendar. Greg McKecker, Melanie Richet, and Fred Delory. Uh, Fred, let's start with you, because the one thing you're watching is the one thing the world's watching, and that's the election south of the border. Yeah, absolutely. The U.S. election, uh, the next three and a half months, is going to, um, Canadians are going to be seized by this. Um, research I saw today showed me that more Canadians per capita are following the U.S. closely than Americans are. Mm -hmm. That's how much Canadians are engaged in this. And Kamala Harris uh, coming in as the replacement uh, nominee is what I'm most interested in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Trump was winning this election against Biden. He was going to win it. Now it looks like it's a race or potentially a race. She's setting records with fundraising. What I'm most curious, though, is, is she going to have a strong message and narrative? Is it something that can resonate and is it something that the Trudeau Liberals can pick up on mm -hmm. and potentially uh, deploy on their own, given the sim similarities between our countries? Uh, now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, the, the Liberals are just going to 
cheat and use the U.S. Uh, <laughs> system and, or their messaging to do it, but it's an opportunity potentially for Trudeau to do a bit of a reset if Kamala can pull this upset off. Of course, she also has, he has the advantage of tr if Trump wins. Trudeau's gone against him before, right. um, prime minister or president, and, and has, has fared quite well. Uh, so that also gives them an opportunity there. So this could, this whole election could be an interesting reset for Trudeau's liberals. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Trump 2.0, I think, would be very different than Trump 1.0 from what we've seen. But Mel, uh, you know, here you have a, a struggling incumbent that the party all loves but said needed to go so there could be change. It happens and suddenly there's new hope. I mean, no way that's going to resonate <laughs> in Canada for a governing party right now, right? Oh, well, that's quite <laughs> funny because typically, you know, something like this that would happen would totally... You, you would totally forget any conversation happening in Canada and you'd be solely mm -hmm. focused on that. But there's some real interesting parallels from exactly what you've just said with, okay, well, is this proof to Trudeau and the people who are tightly surrounding uh, the prime minister that, you know, maybe some, some fresh uh, blood, some, some new ideas is maybe good for your party, maybe good mm -hmm. for, for the stakes at play. And, and what's super interesting, um, about uh, currently Vice President uh, Harris is I think a lot of folks who are in the states were looking at President Biden and at Donald Trump and thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, two old guys, we're here again. Right. I'm not inspired, I'm not motivated, um, I'm a little bit cynical about this. And what we've seen in the last you know, little bit is folks are super motivated, they're um, passionate about what uh, Vice President Harris's presidency could look like, and it, it's almost like it's breathed in um, so much fresh ideas. Yeah. Folks, women specifically, are passionate, interested, and and lining up to um, to work on her campaign. So it'll be interesting how that plays out if there is a chance for her to unseat Trump, and then of course what what that means for for Trudeau here uh, in Canada. Biden and Trump were a combined 159 years old. If you have Polyev, Trudeau, and Singh together, they don't reach that amount, right? That's just <laughs> how old U.S. politics was until the shift. Craig, uh, the Liberals were looking at the U.S. election as a possible inflection point. On the other side, maybe there was a bit of a ricochet uh, effect potentially. What do you think? Well, I, I think in the, the days after the disastrous Biden debate and mm. there were the pr parallel comparisons, folks around the prime minister would say that they had time. It's not you, you know, like the situation with, with President Biden. Um, I, you know, I, I, I agree with that to a point. Events, dear boy, events, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the phrase comes to mind. I think that's uh, a big challenge for them. I would add everything, that, uh, to add one thing to what uh, Mel said. You're absolutely right about vi the vice president. The other big thing was money. Mm. Um, her, um, you know, within that days, first 24 hours was yeah, insane. Just, just yeah. a huge amount of money. And, and I think that's one of the challenges for, for the liberals. You know, I've talked about why are they not running ads? You know, it, it's, you know, they're not fundraising. Um, the way that they used to. I, I think the challenge for the Biden folks was we had saw um, the State of the Union um, and it was late at night and he was very vigorous and the night of the debate he was not and they kept telling us that it was a one-off. But in interview after interview you were not really seeing um, you know, a U-turn on that. Um, I think for Liberals with the Prime Minister is they are, as we've discussed earlier, you know, okay with him staying on, but you've got to give us a reason. Got to see the pivot. You yeah. know, and, and that's what people are, 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 are going to be watching. He does have a good yeah. track record with dealing with Trump, but that was also with everybody came together. You know, that was a multi-partisan approach um, and some very distinguished mm. people from Fred's party, you know, pitched in on that. I don't know if we're going to be in that situation uh, again. Yeah, Canada is obviously watching the U.S. election closely. So is Ukraine, because boy, are the stakes yeah. high for President Zelensky and his people on this. Okay, Greg, let, let's stick with elections, because uh, there's going to be a lot of them this year. Yeah. I mean, we're all focused on November 5th in the U.S., but there's a bunch of provincial elections to watch mm -hmm. as well this fall. Absolutely, and what I like about our panel is that sometimes we do cast our eyes to the, the provinces. Last month, there was uh, the Premier's meeting, and was kind of funny, because they started off telling the federal government to stay in their lane. Then they started talking about the impacts of hurricanes and wildfires, and then Defense they started spending. telling them defense spending. So I think whatever happened there, whoever led that approach on behalf of the premiers and talked their fellow premiers into that, I don't think at the end of it they were very happy. I watched, David, I watched you question a couple of premiers. You asked about Scott Bowe's intervention federally, and they were 
telling you to talk to Premier Mo. So there are a bunch of provincial elections coming up. BC Including is, Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah, BC is well underway. Um, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, um, those, um, there seems to be a bit of a feeling of, of change in the air. The Premier of New Brunswick has uh, said if he wins, he's going to give a big tax cut. And smartly, uh, the federal minister for that province uh, said, well, why don't you just do it now? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of these <laughs> um, premiers were, were taking for granted that they had this you know, leader of the opposition mm -hmm. style. They could throw things, but now they're being called on it. And I think if a couple of premiers um, go down to defeat, it changes the national conversation in a big way. Well, it reinforces something, Fred, because uh, a lot of what Justin Trudeau is dealing with is just this anti-incumbency sentiment. Mm -hmm that exists right around the world coming out of COVID, right? Everyone in power is in trouble, and we're seeing that in provincial areas. I mean, even Francois Legault, who looked in vulnerable, is in third place in some of the polls, and we're going to see New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, B.C. Yeah, B.C. is one I find very fascinating, mm -hmm. where the Conservative Party uh, in B.C. was a fringe party forever. It's had, yeah. uh, it never elects uh, MLAs or rarely does in general elections. It gets a few floor crossers in the, between parliaments and then gets crushed again in the next election. This time they're tied right now. And that is, you know, we're talking about change. We're talking about how people don't like Trudeau. Uh, but this is clearly probably of coattails yeah. in B.C. We're seeing that. Like it is, you, you know, you can't just say that it's Trudeau's unpopular. Mm. Polyev is popular as well. He is uh, breathing life into a lot of uh, conservative areas around the country, and, and we're seeing that. Um, other provinces, you know, Legault has been in for a while, so there is uh, that issue with him. But, um, you know, in Nova Scotia, uh, Tim Houston, Ontario's Doug Ford, they're both, I know they don't have elections this year, or, or do they? Um, <laughs> I think Ford is spring they, at the earliest. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll see. Both, both of them have both, said that they might go earlier. Right, that's what, and, but, and they're both, uh, they'll both get reelected by good margins. They're both very popular, so there is, you know, conservative provinces that are, that are going to do quite well. Mel, they, what, what, they want to go early so they don't have um, a conservative leader as prime well, minister. Well, Tim Houston wants to run while, while Justin Trudeau is Yeah, I think it's more right. Justin I, I, Trudeau I think, than it is yeah. Polyev. I think they well, well the, the four government, according to our, the reporting in the stars, they don't want to have the run with the cuts they anticipate coming from a Polyev government. So there's a bunch of, like, I don't know, 3D checkers maybe. I don't even know if it amounts to chess. Um, uh, Mel, uh, what are your thoughts on the by-election, or sorry, the provincial elections we're going to see, not by-elections? Right, well, I think all of them, uh, especially BC, will have direct impacts on mm -hmm. what happens federally and, and the calculations, I think, of all parties um, um, federally going into our next federal election. Um, but I think I would just remind folks that um, the Manitoba Conservatives tried to run on Pyotr record and it didn't really work out for them. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in British Columbia. Scott Moe's not necessarily doing, doing the same play there, but um, NBC mm. in particular, again, and I know we talked about this off the top, but the... Um, and, and you kind of mentioned it, they were kind of a fringe party. The, um, I think they're bringing in a lot of folks who are, are you know, solid conservatives from across the country into that, into that provincial election, which I, is, is likely smart for the conservatives. But the um, inexperience, I think, there right. may cause some problems. I think, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Premier EB, and I hope they, they hold that. But I think the inexperience there will hurt them there, and I think it'll hurt the federal conservatives. Okay, well, we got a couple of minutes left, yep. but uh, we're gonna. You wanted to highlight something that we kind of talked about a little bit in the NDP conversation, but you really want to zero in on the supply and confidence agreement and whether or not it makes it through the fall. I mean, wh where are you on that? Yeah, I think that that's definitely something to to um, look out for. I am um, a big fan of the message that Jigmeet is pushing this summer, and that that Jigmeet is. Um, sharing with Canadians from across the coast. And we saw that resonate a little bit in Toronto St. Paul's that people are saying, listen, the Prime Minister doesn't understand what I'm going through. Every time he's given the opportunity to talk about what I'm going through, like he had on your show um, back in June, he doesn't really have a why. Why am I in this? Why am I doing this? Right. What is my plan? What is my vision? Um, and I think um, I would, you know, I think Jagmeet's going to have a vision. I think he's going to have a plan. I think he's going to be sharing that with folks. And if that doesn't line up with, with the deal, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, uh, if that deal didn't make it to the end of it. So I would keep my eye on that. And so do you think you could come back from summer and say, hey, I've seen enough, we've done enough, that's it? Or what, what do you think? I think he's going to pay really close attention to the feeling right. on the ground, and, and we'll see in the fall. Okay, Greg, uh, 30 seconds on that. I, I would say the same advice I gave a few weeks back to the NDP, to the Liberals. Get a list ready of everything that you accomplished. Mm -hmm. Tell Canadians, we made this parliament work. You see who we've got as the leader of the opposition, but we worked with the leader of the NDP, and we got all these things accomplished for you. We made parliament work. 
Right, but do you think, so you don't think the liberals will look at ending it early? I mean, they want to keep going as long as they can, because time, it's as you It's say. tough to say you want to make parliament work and you end the deal early. Yeah, that's a good point. No, I, I appreciate you for pointing out the dumbness that I brought to the conversation. <laughs> uh, Fred, uh, what, what do you think on supply and confidence agreement? Uh, how do you think the, the two coalition partners, as you like to call them, uh, deal with this come September? Oh, I think, I think we're going to see a, a, a nasty divorce. Uh, come September, mm. they're going to split. Uh, I hope it's nasty. I hope if the NDP, <laughs> if the NDP are oh, going to pick a lane, they need to go strong mm. and they need to go against uh, the Liberals. They can't just say, "Okay, the deal's done," but we're still going to prop this government up. Because mm. then, what are they doing? Yes. I'm